welcome Ken Scott. Thank, Thank you, you very much for being here. My pleasure. Hi. So I don't mean to begin by criticizing you, but there's some mistakes oh, in this kidding? record. I don't know how many of you were here this morning for Nigel, but uh, he was saying about recording on, he, I think he actually said 16 track, or it may have been, no, it was 24. Well, that was recorded on an eight track. And talk about having to make decisions and how those decisions are made, not necessarily under the right circumstances. We were recording that track, and when we did the basic track, uh, it became obvious that the snare beats, that it, it starts with the snare beat going blap, blap, and that occurs several times through the song. Ringo's single snare drum, it wasn't enough. So we decided that we'd overdub a whole bunch more snares every time that occurred. Fine. We bounce all of those snares down onto track eight. And we continue overdubs. Then we come to what we think is the last overdub of, of the recording. It finished up, it wasn't. We did some other stuff. But uh, it was the recorders that come after the solo. And the recorders were being played by Paul McCartney and Chris Thomas, George Martin's assistant. We didn't have a track to put them on. Uh, so some bright spark came up with the idea of, well, they come after the snares, the last set of snares there. Why don't we just punch in on that track and put them on there? Well, fine. There, there was certainly enough room to do that, but the second engineer I had working with me that day was brand new to Beatles Sessions. He was very new, actually, to Abbey Road Studios, and I didn't trust him. <laughs> Stupid asshole. But, uh, so... I wouldn't let him do it. So don't worry, guys, I'll take care of it. So I go over, I sit by the eight track, and after many, many attempts at them getting the recorder part, and me punching in after that last blap, blap, and them not getting it, not getting it, finally I lost that, that concentration. And as opposed to going into play, letting the blap, blap go, and then hitting record, I went straight into record. So it finished up, there was only one snare drum there. And I thought, that's it. Like many other occasions in my, my life, I thought, okay, that's it, I'm out the door, they're going to can me. Uh, but John, in his inimitable fashion, was standing by the side of me and said, let me listen to it again. And I played it to him. And he said, you know what? No one would ever conceive of going to the smallest part in the song after the biggest part in the song. I like it, we'll keep it. And that's why when you listen, you'll hear, I think it's three fairly big, hefty blap blaps, and then the last one after the solo is just one snare. It comes really small, and it was purely an error, and we couldn't cut and paste the way you can these days, and so we, we had to go with it. There was no way of fixing it, and it's gr that, to me, is what makes music human. It, its mistakes can be good if used in the right way, and I can't tell you the number of people that have said to me, God, the Beatles were so brilliant. The way they came up with just going to that small snare after the biggest part, incredible. Well, it wasn't their brilliance, it was my fuck up. But, uh. <laughs> but yeah, I guess it does speak to the idea that the Beatles, and I think maybe you said this once, they're open to Absolutely. that idea. They're extremely experimental. Oh, for, for, for me, the... Once again, one of the things, I, I was sitting at the back when Nigel, uh, Nigel was talking earlier, and it was absolutely fascinating for me. Here, here he was, the next generation down from me, and he was voicing so many of the things. Both of the guys were voicing so many of the things that my generation feel. And one of the things that, that he was saying was about the, the training that he went through. He started uh, at a studio called Trident Studios, which was where I moved to after Abbey Road, and but I left before he started there. But the training back then was absolutely phenomenal. With, with I started at Abbey Road at age 16. I started off in the tape library and then moved up to become button pusher, as we were called back then, because all we did was sit at the tape machine and hit play, hit record, hit rewind. So just hit buttons. We weren't allowed to set up sessions or anything like that. There was no way we were allowed to touch the mixing console. Uh, but I got to sit there and watch 
six of the most amazing recording engineers in the world at that, that point. There were three pop and three classical. And you could just sit there and, well, Chris Parker would use Neumann U47s on the strings, whereas Malcolm Addy on a pop session would n use Neumann U67s and he'd move them a lot closer. And you got to learn all of this, this kind of thing, just sitting there and seeing it. And that doesn't, that's not around these days. And then finally, moving to, to the, the point you had made with the Beatles, when I eventually was moved up to being an engineer, it was the most amazing learning experience because here I was. The first session I ever did, as sitting behind the board, I'd never sat behind the board before, and it was to record the Beatles. And I, I was petrified. I had absolutely no idea what the hell I was doing. But I had worked with them as a second engineer from side two of A Hard Day's Night through Rubber Soul. So we'd built up a relationship, and I think because of that relationship, they were prepared to give me a second chance, and we, we continued and worked together a lot more. But working with them, most engineers, when they start in the, in the studio, they would have to do recording tests, or they'd do ads, and things like that. When they did actually get to record a band back then, you'd quite often have to record two or three songs in a three-hour session. So you couldn't, you had to be right on the entire time. Working with the Beatles, they would take forever. So I, I it gave, and plus they liked to experiment. So I, as a young engineer, could try any mics that I wanted to and learn what they did. To show you how silly it got at times, Paul and I would go into the, the mic closet and he'd say, oh, I like the look of that one. Uh, let's try that on bass drum. Just the way it looked. Yeah, just the way it looked. So I always had the feeling that I could, let's say, record a piano with completely the wrong mic in completely the wrong place, completely screw up the EQ, completely over compress it. And it would sound like shit, but there was just as much chance of them coming up and saying, oh, that sounds like shit, as it was, yeah, it, it's not very good, but we like it, we'll use it. So I was never afraid to experiment, uh, which most of the engineers of, at Abbey Road at that point, they didn't have that opportunity. So it, it was phenomenal working with them. They were always open to, to ideas. Tell me about EMI back then. The way I, uh, in reading your book, the way I... Uh, felt about it was that it was very um, buttoned up for the engineers was, yeah, on the well, engineer it, side. It, it was very staid. It was this was uh, still not too long after the, the the Second World War, and there were still bomb sites around everywhere, and all of that kind of thing. And the mentality was was suit and tie for everyone. Uh, the 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 engineers had to wear suit white white shirt and a tie. Uh, the second engineers had to wear, at the very least, they had to wear nice dress pants and a, and a shirt, normally with a tie. They didn't necessarily have to wear jackets all the time. We weren't allowed to take our jackets off during a session. Uh, we, we had the, the hierarchy, if you like, at Abbey Road. There were the brown coats. They would like the, the studio roadies. They would help musicians in with their instruments. They'd put chairs out for the orchestra. And they were called brown coats because they would be wear, they'd be wearing relatively good clothes, but they'd wear these brown lab coats kind of thing so they didn't get dirty. Then you had the maintenance engineers, the amp room guys. They would wear white lab coats to cover up their suits. Now, I've heard so many people comment on everyone was wearing white coats coats there they weren't it was only the maintenance guys and it made absolute everything that happened at EMI it was very staid but there was a very very good reason why they did things they'd been around since 1936 I think in that particular building and the amp room guys they they had to coil up they were the ones that always set up the sessions they put out the mics an engineer couldn't even put out a mic at that point he could move it to where he wanted it but he couldn't take it from the mic mic room closet and put it out in the studio floor they had to do it so they were coiling up all of these dirty cables they would have to go into the echo chambers which were often musty damp and and not very nice so they didn't want to get these suits dirty so <laughs> wear white lab coats it made absolute sense and of course there was the engineers in suits and it seems like that. you got the best of both worlds then you yeah. got the very strict training of being at EMI Absolutely. but then you were working with the most experimental band Absolutely. There. it was it was Unbelievable, the training. And 
the the whole thing with with the Beatles, they they started to change everything. The first thing that they they changed was the hours of working. Generally speaking, at, at Abbey Road when I started, the sessions were from ten to one in the morning, two thirty to to five thirty in the afternoon, and seven to ten in the evening. Uh, which just happened to sort of go with the English licensing hours, the pub hours at that point. But uh, I don't know if it was planned that way or not. But the Beatles started to, to change that. They would come in late and they'd go to all hours in the morning. And what happened was the the old-time engineers there didn't like to work under those sort of situations. They, they all had families. They were all in their 40s or 50s and had families. They wanted to finish at a certain time and go home to spend time with their families. Uh, so they didn't want to work with the Beatles. So what happens? Before me was Jeff Emmerich, a young engineer. that He'd, he'd been an engineer for six months and he was put on the sessions. And uh, as a young guy, he loved it. He didn't have a family to get home to, making good money. And it was it's a great chat up line oh yes i'm working with the beatles <gasps> oh <laughs> yeah right uh the trouble was we were spending too much time in the studio working with the beatles to be able to use that chat up line <laughs> but uh so and then when when jeff decided he didn't want to work with with the beatles anymore then it was i was next in line so they moved me straight up and once again, a young guy, so I was I was eager to do it and didn't mind the long hours or anything like that or, or whatever. So, uh, I want to move along to and do a lot of different things, but one last question. Was there ever a point at which working with the Beatles where you were finally like, okay, I don't feel like I'm going to get fired? <laughs> no. But, never. <laughs> never. I, I, most of my life I felt, oh, that I'm going to get kicked out any given time. It's... You, those insecurities, that's what push for me, it's what pushes me to a point. It, it's, I've got to prove my worth. Well, let's play another song then. Uh, this is moving along a little bit. Yeah. Boy, there was, some, there was some strange compression on there. It was weird, it was kicking in at times. Um, you didn't think this guy had what it takes. No, first of all, I. I <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I first met David. He'd recorded Space Oddity uh, as a single, and it had done fairly well. So, at that point, the the record company Mercury decided they wanted to do an album with him. And uh, I was recently, I recently moved to to Trident Studios. And they put me on the sessions, or some of the sessions, with Tony Visconti. He was producing, I was engineering. And we, we did the album, and yeah, yeah, David was a nice guy. He was very pleasant. Uh, obviously had a certain amount of talent, but superstar? <laughs> no, no way. Then I got to work with him on uh, Man Who Sold the World. Once again, uh, it, that was recorded at another studio, and then uh, Tony and Tony brought it to Trident to uh, do some overdubs and mix. Once again, it was David was a nice guy, obviously a certain amount of talent, but eh, never a superstar. The album didn't do very well at all, so David took some time off and he he studied with a mime artist called Lindsay Camp, and he came in. He'd obviously been writing, and he still had the music bug in him. So he came in with a friend of his to uh, to produce a, a single with with his friend. And because I'd worked with David before, I was put on the sessions with him. Now, that particular session is always going to be in my dreams, both in, as a nightmare and as a very pleasant experience. The nightmare comes from the fact... How many of you know what uh, hot pants are? Any of you? Okay, okay. Well, not enough of you, obviously. Hot pants, for those that don't know, are very short, tight shorts that uh, some women wear. And I, I'd have to say that 95% of the women that wear them shouldn't, and uh, the other 5%, very nice. Uh, the, the thing was that David's friend was wearing the shortest tightest hot pants any of us at the studio had ever seen and he shouldn't have been 
We were awaiting a wardrobe malfunction the entire session. Luckily, it never happened. So that's the nightmare side of the story. And the very pleasant side of it was I'd reached the point that so many engineers reach where you're doing a session, you're sitting next to the, the producer, and you suddenly have an idea. And it's, hey, wouldn't it be great to have 15 roaring elephants doing the solo here? And the, the, engineer, uh, the producer is... Hey, guys, why don't we try 15 roaring elephants doing the solo here? Okay, if you think so, and you try it. And if it works, the producer will always take credit. If it doesn't work, it's, ah, oh, that was only Ken's idea anyway. I didn't think it would work, but I had to sort of calm him down a little. That was happening a little too frequently, so I had decided I wanted to make the change to have more of the artistic say and move into production. The pleasant dream experience. Uh, David, I, I happened to voice my feelings to David about wanting to move into production. And David said, well, I've just signed a new management deal. They want to put me into the studio to record an album. I don't know that I'm capable of doing it all on my own. Will you co-produce it with me? So here's my mind ticking over. Here's a very nice guy who has a certain amount of talent, but... I'm going to do my first production. I can make all the mistakes in the world because no one's ever going to hear this record because he's never going to be a superstar. So, yeah, David, I'd love to do it, of course. <laughs> then a few weeks later, David and his wife Angie come round to my house and we're going through material for the album and suddenly the light bulb goes off and it's... Here I go again in at the deep end. It's this guy is amazingly talented and there is every possibility that a lot of people will hear every single mistake I make on, on production of the album and that finished up being hunky dory. So you can now all blame me for the mistakes on that. Where are the mistakes on that in your mind? Uh, if you haven't heard them, then I'm not certainly not gonna tell you. I, I do need to explain one thing. I, I held you off from fading that down for a very specific reason. I've been asked a lot of times about the ending on that song, which is kind of weird. You hear the piano come back in and something going on behind it. Uh, normally I, I have a computer and I can hit the button and actually play what happens, so I just have to explain it this time. We, had, we were recording analog onto tape and as generally happened, we made decisions back then as to whether it was the take or not. If it wasn't the take, we would go back and record over. This particular occasion, they were doing a, an amazing take. Rick Wakeman was on piano, there was Trevor Boulder on bass and uh, Woody Womansey playing drums. We were getting through and it was a really good take and suddenly this phone which was in the, the bathroom at the, at the side of the studio started to ring and it was picked up on the piano mics which were right by the door of, of this bathroom and we had to stop the take and uh, Mick Ronson who happened to be in the studio was just cursing and swearing like mad because we had to stop it. So went back to the beginning of the tape, started to record another take again. And I don't know if we, they just started earlier or if, if they played it faster or what, but it turned out that we didn't erase over the complete earlier take. There was just the ending of it uh, came back in. We didn't even realize it until we did the strings. And they're just sustaining at the end. Nothing else is playing. And then suddenly the piano came back in and then the phone comes in and then you hear Rono cursing and swearing. So, we've got to use it, we've got to use it. But of course we had to pull it down very fast uh, so that we, didn't, we couldn't have swearing. The BBC would have banned it instantly and we didn't want that. So. But uh, that's the story of the ending and that's why I wouldn't let you bring it down. Mick Ronson, you mentioned his name. Oh, he seems yeah. like a, the secret weapon most of that group in a way. Oh, I don't think there's anything secret about him. It's, no, once again, very, very nice guy, uh, very, very down-to-earth, great guitarist. Aside from when the phone's ringing. Uh, oh, no, still, he's down-to-earth. He just <laughs> curses like a sailor, as we all do in the studio from time to time, and in lectures from time to time as well. Uh, not only was he a great guitarist, he was also a very imaginative arranger when it came to strings and brass, like some of the stuff he did for, for David at the end of five years. Uh, just what he he writes for strings is it's absolutely bizarre. And some of the stuff he did on the, the Transformer album with Lou Reed was just... I don't know anyone else that would have come up with stuff like that. He was, he was amazing. And... Uh, 
a, a real shame that he he died so young. Just it, it happens, unfortunately. One of the things that I found really fascinating about Bowie in particular is that it seems like he would do one or two vocal takes, and that was it. Not often did he do two. Uh, I, d I co-produced four albums with David, and I would say that 95% of the vocals that we did were first takes from beginning to end. Uh, I would get the level, take the tape back, we'd go through, and that's the vocal you hear. They're not perfect. They're sometimes slightly out of tune, sometimes slightly out of time, but they're real. They are emotional from him. I, I, I don't know if any of you were there yesterday at the classic album Sundays thing where, when there was uh, myself, Tony Visconti and Nile Rogers talking about various things. I played there the ending of Five Years, which had a whole bunch of people almost in tears, uh, which David was in tears at the end of Five Years. He's screaming. He is feeling such emotion. It wouldn't be allowed today. It would have to be auto-tuned. It would have to be moved around. Uh, but I think that's one of the reasons that we're still talking about these albums after all this time is they're real, they're human, and they, they, they reach you here more. They reach you here more than they do up here. And I think today a lot of the music is done more for up here than it is for down here. Is that a philosophy that you took later on in your career with other bands? You were just saying, listen, you know, I, one take that has feeling oh, that, stop i wish <laughs> oh no it, it it it's different strokes for different folks there there is no right or wrong way it, it, it's you do whatever has to be done uh, as a, as a producer you you you're every you're the shrink you're the dictator you're the best friend you everything every form of a relationship you can think of you are that at some point i i I've been in the u unique experience of seeing every side of Jeff Beck. I started with, with Jeff. I did the first uh, Jeff Beck group album, an album called Truth, uh, as an engineer. And that was with Ronnie Wood on bass. It was Rod Stewart doing the vocals. And we had a blast. We did it very quickly. All of the albums back then were done very quickly, by the way. Something else. This was brought forth yesterday quite a lot. It's There is nothing quite like having a bunch of musicians in the studio playing together and they all feed off of one another and the buzz that comes from that it, it's unlike any other drug that you can imagine it, it just feels so good so uh we we did the truth album very quickly we had a lot of fun doing it and that was it they they toured america where suddenly they were gods so you were his best friend in the studio, well, we, in that we, situation, we, well, not yeah, the we shrink, just, we, not no, the, no, I was yeah. just the engineer, so uh, it, it was just sit there and twiddle the knobs more than anything, but we all got on very well, it was nice. So they toured the States, the States make them think that they're gods, they come back in to do the next album, within the first day, the egos were unbelievable, and it was obvious we, wouldn't, we couldn't work together, we just, it, it, I don't like egos particularly. Unless it's mine, but uh, so I, I, the sessions were cancelled and, and they moved off and, and did the second album somewhere else. Then I got to work with Jeff a little bit later on. I did some albums with uh, a bass player called Stanley Clark, and Jeff would come in and guest on one track on each of the albums. And Jeff was back to normal. He was a regular guy, and we got on great again. So we've gone from regular, ego, regular. Then I get a phone call. Jeff was in the midst of doing an album called There and Back uh, with Jan Hammer producing. And they had a falling out over something that Jan did on stage one day, tried to upstage Jeff, and they just fell apart. And so I got a phone call to, to go in and finish the album. And suddenly it was the complete opposite of the ego with, with Jeff. He didn't feel good enough to be playing with the, the musicians he was playing with. And so that particular time, that was really the shrink because at that point it was trying to pull performances out of him. And I find it easier to calm someone down than, than pull out the performances. That was really hard, but we managed to, to get it together and finish the album and it came out very well. But uh, So, yeah, it, it's different strokes for different folks at different times. It, it's full circle with Jeff. 
Uh, let's play another tune. You mentioned uh, Lou Reed and Transformer. How did you get that job with Lou Reed? Lou Reed. Well, David, because it was a David Bowie McGronson production. So it was right in the middle. We'd, we'd done uh, Ziggy. And uh, they, they, it, it was kind of strange because they were day sessions, which was unusual for, for David. But they were rehearsing for a, a big rainbow show that they were doing in the evening. So we would finish about six or seven. They'd dash over to the rainbow to, to rehearsals. And we'd come back in the next day. And then typically uh, with, with David, David was got very bored in the studio. He didn't like being in there particularly. And so once he'd finished his role, he was out the door. So that, that always left me the freedom. The, the time that I came most into play with, with all of his stuff was transferring the, the most basic recording and finishing doing the mixing and everything. He, he, was, ne he was at two mixes during the entire time I worked with him. And uh, it was exactly the same with this. He wasn't around for, a, for he was on a, he was on Queen Elizabeth II on his way to New York whilst I was mixing this. It's a very interesting production, obviously. It doesn't sound like a lot of other Lou Reed's work. What was the creative process like? I mean, did he come <laughs> in with the idea for this arrangement? Lou would come in and stumble through the song to Rono. And then Rono would transfer what the song actually was to the session musicians that were being used. And then this, the arrangement would be worked out on the spot. Uh, the, the, the amazing bass part on that was a, an English session guy who's played on so many damn records called Herbie Flowers. He was amazing. And he, he, the way he tells the story is... is really good but uh, basically we lay down the basic track with I think it was acoustic guitar upright bass and drums once we got the take uh, Herbie comes running upstairs he has this idea and the reason that he had the idea was back in those days when you played twice when a session musician played twice they got paid double the money they got double scale so he suddenly thought, okay, somehow I've got to put another bass on top of it. And he came out, we're doing it, I think he says it's a 12th or something like that on electric bass, doubling it, and that's the incredible bass part that's on there. And it was purely, it came purely from monetary desires. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, working with Lou was very, very strange. He was, he was there... Physically, I, I don't think he was there mentally much of the time. A couple of weeks after finishing the album. Now, Lou did come along to all the mixes. And didn't that was quite different from David. Obviously. Oh, yes, yes. He was there. He could just as well have not been there. He never said anything, but uh, he sat at the, by the side all the time. And two weeks later, after we'd completed, it, it was my wedding anniversary or something, and I was out with my wife at a Chinese restaurant just down the road from, from the studios. And suddenly all of these people from RCA, the label that Lou was on, come waltzing in. I knew most of them. They came over to the table and were saying hi. And suddenly one of them, hey, Lou, come over and say hey. Say hello, it's Ken. And he just stands there and looks at looks at me, he has absolutely no idea who the hell I am. It was only two weeks ago that we completed his damn album. But, uh, yeah, that was Lou back then. What about the vocals? The Oh, sorry. No, go no, ahead. go ahead. You may be covering what I was just going to interject, so keep going. I'm just interested. I don't know the story exactly about the vocalists that come in. Uh, oh, the Colored Girls? Yeah. Oh, the Colored Girls were three white Jewish girls. And, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it was obvious that we needed some, some background singers. David said, do you know any? And I called in this, this group that I knew called Thunder Thighs. And <laughs> they did it. It was perfect. And the, the whole thing of them walking forward, uh, coming from way back and, and coming forward, that was me and pure boredom. You can only hear do, 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 do so many times before you want to change it somehow. And the, the way I decided to change it was, okay, let's see if I can get it so it sounds as if they're walking forward singing and just had the had the 
the reverb set and I just the reverb was always the same. I just changed the level of them. So you hear most of the reverb to start with, with them just back a little bit, and I gradually bring them forward and forward until they're right in your face. And that, that was one of the, the amazing arrangements that, that Rono did for strings. It's just, yeah, just brilliant. I, I wish you could hear it a little more just on, it, on its own. Because I just, it's so unusual. You were working on this album at Trident, right? Correct. Um, so you'd left EMI, and you'd gone to this other place. Yes. Can you talk about the difference between the two studios? I, the, the, the major difference was just the attitude. It was, as I'd already said, uh, EMI was, was very staid. Uh, it, was, it did change a little because of the Beatles, but it was still very staid. Trident was the complete opposite. It was very laid back. You could wear jeans and a T-shirt. Uh, musicians would come by and just hang out because it was a great hangout place. Uh, as a studio, the, the studio was smaller than number two at, at Abbey Road. It still had the control room upstairs that looked down, uh, which several English studios had. There were, number two studio, Olympic was the same, Trident. It just... We all had basically this similar equipment. The 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 desks at uh, or the desk at, when I first started at, at Trident was a Sound Techniques board, uh, a small English company that made incredible boards. A lot of people seem to think that uh, most of the stuff at Trident was done on a Trident A range board. There, that's a very popular board. They only ever made thirteen of them, but people will pay a fortune to get to get them or to get parts from them. And that, that's incorrect. The, the, the Trident A range was in there only for a short period of time. And even then, up in the mix room, uh, all of the uh, early Elton John stuff, the, all of the Bowie stuff, a lot of the Queen stuff, uh, most of the... Uh, Nielsen, Carly Simon, th their albums were all mixed on a Sound Techniques board, which was, was amazing. And they're just about... I've been told they're just about to start remaking them again, so that would be interesting. But and it, was, it was more, as I say, a mental thing than it, than it was a difference in, a, in the studios. When you started working for Trident, um, it may have been a little bit down the road, but you ended up having a management company that was separate from Trident, but obviously you're re renting their studio time. Is that right? I, I, I think you're, you're probably thinking of a production company. Yeah. When, okay, okay, yeah. No, I, I... Myself, all three engineers at, at Trident at the same time, we'd all got fed up with that producer thing of the, you know, the, the roaring elephant syndrome. Uh, and we had discussed amongst ourselves. There was myself, there was Roy Thomas Baker that went on to produce so many hits, uh, and a, an engineer called Robin Jeffrey Cable. We all wanted to get into production, and so we spoke to the, we all, we spoke to the management and owners of, of Trident Studios, and they said, that's great, well, we'll set up production companies for, for each of you, which we'll look after. They basically became our managers, and each of us had our own company. It was just, I... I happened to break through faster than the others because of Mr. Bowie. But, uh, no, we, we all had the same kind of thing. Ziggy Stardust went number one. It, right? it did very well, I think, number yeah. one. And But you didn't see a lot of money from uh, your work with Bowie. No, not for... Well, I've never seen everything you should. I don't think any any artist or producer ever sees everything they should get because all of these damn record companies keep uh, two sets of books as far as I'm concerned. I have tried on numerous occasions to talk attorneys into filing a class action lawsuit against every major label out there uh, because once, once an artist becomes successful, they will go in and they'll audit the record company's books. I have heard of many, many occasions when they've gone in and done that. And every single occasion, it has turned out that the accounts were in the record company's favor. Oh, we're sorry, that must have been a mistake. A mistake doesn't happen every single solitary time. Also, it always turns around that they will say, well, you've got to prove this, you'll have to sue us for it. The artist isn't going to go into court 
in a court of law and try and get every penny. So the record company says, well, we'll pay you half of what you say we owe you. Every single time they accept that. And every single time they have to sign a non-disclosure contract that says they can't talk about it. So the, it, it, it is so obvious to me after... I've now been in the recording business for 50, 49 and a half years. It only took it's, that long. <laughs> it only took that long, yeah. No, so, yeah, I, I, but it wasn't some, with David, it wasn't so much the record company as it was his manager, uh, Mr. Tony DeFries, who screwed everyone. He, he wanted to be uh, the English Colonel Tom Parker, the way... The, this is Elvis' yeah, manager. Yes, Elvis' manager. I think he probably, uh, he may even have passed Colonel Tom Parker. But just as an example, just to tell you what David was on for, for a while, uh, his original contract with, with Tony DeFries was, Tony DeFries took 50% of gross. David would do a tour. He would have to pay out of his own pocket all expenses for the tour. And... That was after Tony DeFries had taken his 50% off the top. Watch out for deals like that, guys. Yeah, I remember one of the tours, it was uh, art, an artistic decision for him to go out there with just a light. Just, just the neon tubes. Yeah, that was after he had actually got out of his deal. He'd won his lawsuit and got out of his deal with, with DeFries at that point. So that was going to be the first tour where he would actually start to make money. So he so, knew the stage show. Had to be as limited as possible. Yes, of course, <laughs> David is. Well, he may have been stupid signing the original deal, but he learned fast. What other lessons? I mean, from the that business side of things, can, uh, do you feel like are are really important and still very relevant to you know some of the participants out here today? Uh, one look. One of the things is you're going to make mistakes. You're going to give money away that. Y- at some point down the line, oh, why the hell did I sign that? Or why didn't I do that? That's the way we learn. It's by mistakes. I learned about not punching in too early on Glass Onion and just everything. You learn by your mistakes, but make sure you do learn from them. It's, what's the fool me once uh, on me, fool me, uh, on you, fool me, whatever. But it's, <laughs> it's, that, it's that kind of thing. It, it's make a mistake, learn from it, just don't make the mistake again kind of thing. Uh, there, there are so many strange legal things that you're not going to know them all. I, I, I did an album with a band called Kansas. This was way after their their biggest hits. In the in the midst of the the working on the album, Kerry Livgren, who was the the main guy in the band, really. Uh, he and I were talking and he told me about how they signed their recording contract and he said they were they'd been offered a deal by uh it was Don Kirshner's company which was distributed through what is now Sony and they were playing playing a gig in this small club down in Atlanta and their recording contract arrived and they had to sign it there and then they're going through, there are all of these clips where they have to sign it and they sign all of these pages. And then they find this extra bit at the back that also had clips on where they had to sign. They, well, we've never seen this before, but I guess we have to sign it. So they all signed. That was their publishing. They had given away all of their publishing. I, I said to Kerry, well, that, you didn't show that to an attorney? And he said, no. I said, well, that contract is illegal then because you, are, you cannot sign. A, th- these days there is generally a clause in every contract that states you have had it looked at by, le- by a, an attorney. If you haven't, then it's more for you kind of thing because you've signed that you have. Uh, back then that didn't happen. So that contract was actually illegal because they didn't take legal advice on it. He, he said to me, ah, come on, you're wrong. Wait, th- we would have been told that ages ago. Okay, look, I'm not going to argue with you. That's the way I understand it. But do me a favor. Next time you, you go see, sit down with your attorney, ask him for me, will you? He said, okay, yeah, I'll do that. And I didn't think he'd ever do it. A couple of weeks later, the band come in late for the session and they'd had a meeting with their attorney. 
And Kerry came up to me and said, I have to apologize. And I said, why? He said, I asked our attorney and was told that you were absolutely correct. We could have got all of our millions of dollars of publishing back had we known. But the problem was, because they'd been successful, they had gone in and renegotiated with an attorney who didn't know about how it had been signed in the first place. So because they'd gone in with an attorney, they could never go back on it. So they, they just lost the millions because they didn't take proper advice. It, so it, it, it's have always, an attorney yeah, well, look nah, yeah, stuff. Just take proper advice. It doesn't, you can't even necessarily rely on your manager to give you, because they'd had a manager, a top manager, for years. He was with them when they signed it. <laughs> didn't realize, didn't know. It, it's, it takes 49 and a half years to learn all of these things, I guess. Uh, let's play another song. Um, this is, well, I think you'll recognize it. Thank you. He gave me permission. <laughs> uh, I, I, I have to say one thing here. Uh, I've, I've had absolutely amazing highs in my life from, from what I chose to do for a living. One of the lowest points was walking through a supermarket and hearing that playing in the background. It, it's, we have reached the point where so many of the people that uh, fought against the man, it's now you walk down a bloody supermarket and you hear them, their records playing. It's just so disturbing. It really is. Sorry, you were going to ask. No. Um I guess I was going to say one of the another lesson from the industry is something you learned a little bit before this, but use this in it's always record in France if you can. The, oh well, no, we we I did quite a few records at the Chateau de Reville in uh, just outside of Paris, and that that was purely a mon monetary thing for the exactly. artists, tax free. So, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the way the English law was at that that point was. Uh, if the majority of stuff was done outside of the country, as long as that money never entered England, then you didn't have to pay tax on it. So uh, Elton did three albums in, in France. Uh, David, we did pinups in France. Uh, Floyd recorded over there. Uh, yeah, several people record. Mark Boland did. So yeah, all for the tax reason. What were the challenges of recording in this different environment? First and foremost, just getting used to it. I had been so used to... I basically worked in two places, uh, Abbey Road and then Triton. And with any studio, it takes a while to get used to it, knowing it, it's it, it's good points and it's bad points, I, I guess. Uh, one the, the most important thing for me within any studio are the monitors. You, It doesn't matter what any of the other gear is, as long as the monitors are good, you know how it's going to turn out in the end. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into, the, into one story to, to demonstrate that because it, it's jumping back too far. But for, first and foremost, working in a new place is getting to know the monitors. Uh, we also had the problem of at Trident, where Elton had always worked before, there was a drum booth. So with, with the uh, piano, which he always played on the tracks, uh, there wasn't much leakage from from the drums. The chateau, it didn't have any drum booths, so there's Nigel Olsen set up, and right in front of him is the piano. So we got one hell of a lot of leakage, which we couldn't use. And so Gus Dudgeon, the producer, sent out for some French carpenters and had them come in, and they traced around the top of the piano and made this huge thing that just came over the entire piano with just two holes in it for me to put the mics through, and it completely blocked off the piano from anything else. It's, it's, things like that. You, you learn going into other studios things you have to do, and that's one of the things we had to do there. What was the most striking thing about working with Elton John for you? Uh, well, he was a nice guy. He was quite talented, but superstar? No, nah, never. Uh, I, I had the most amazing experience seeing him write Rocket Man. Uh, we were in pre-production, and the way it always worked, Bernie Taupin, the lyricist, would go up to his room at uh, about 8 o'clock in the evening, 
and he'd come down at breakfast the next day. It was communal living. We all sat around this big table and had, had breakfast and dinner together. And so Bernie would come down, he'd hand out in these, uh, Reg as it was back then, he hadn't formally changed his name. So we all, it was, yeah, Reg, he brought them down to Reg and he'd be going through them and he'd pull out a couple and then after he'd finished breakfast he'd go over to the piano, he'd put the, the lyrics up and he'd just start to play and this one particular occasion, ten minutes, he had Rocket Man complete and he was singing it there and the band were already set up as it was pre-production, they were set up by the side of the piano and after we'd all finished it would just be sorting out the arrangement and then when everything had been completed like that it was over to the studio to record. It just um, 10 minutes to write that song, incredible. I heard he's also quite good at foosball. <laughs> Boy, you did read the book, didn't you? Uh, yeah, it, it was one of, one of the ways we passed time was playing foosball. And someone decided to start a championship. Now, I was absolutely bloody atrocious at this game. I couldn't do it for love or money. But uh, they, they set up this championship and everyone had to be a part of it. And I was teamed up with, with one of the roadies, who was also equally bad. We actually start winning and we're, we're beating people and we, we come to the finals. Something clicked with us and we get to the finals and we're playing Elton and Gus. Neither of whom like to lose. <laughs> so it was determined it was going to be the best of three. We won the first one. Of course, Elton and Gus are... <sighs> They really get on top of it, and they win the second one, and it's okay. It's the third one. This is win or walk out. Everyone was crowded around the table, and me and the roadie got it. <laughs> Suddenly, Elton, it's best of five. <laughs> we played on two more, and they won the next one, and we won the fifth one. So, Just the idea of Elton John playing foosball. Completely blew my mind as I was reading the book, so I, I had to... Monopoly was the good one, because if you started to lose, it would suddenly go flying. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's play uh, one more track. This is uh, from a solo album, uh, one of the Beatles that you worked on. That was George Harrison, my sweet lord. I learned very early on not to get starstruck. Uh, he was the exception till the last day I saw him. He... Why him more well, than the, the other Beatles? It seems he, like he was, he was the one you had the most kind yeah, of I was strongest relationship him. with. He, he was just an amazing person. Uh, there's, there's been so much written about him being dour and down the entire time and the quiet one. Uh, Eric Idle once said of, of George that uh, he was always qu quoted as being the quiet Beatle, but uh, anyone that knew him knew that once he started, there was no shutting him up. Uh, as far as being dour, he was, he was one of the funniest people I've ever met. Just as an example, uh, they were mixing Yellow Submarine surround sound at Abbey Road. Uh, and... George and Ringo were invited to, to go and hear what they were doing. And they go, they're upstairs listening. And it just so happened down in number one, the, the very big studio at Abbey Road, uh, Mel Gibson was doing music for one of his movies. I think it was The Patriot at the time. And it, typically with uh, any of the Beatles, it, it, the top film stars, if it's a Beatle, they've got to meet them. It, it's, they're, they're above everyone. So Mel Gibson heard that uh, Ringo and George were upstairs and he passed word up, could he go up and meet them? Word came back down, yeah, sure, send him up. So he went upstairs and he meets Ringo first, he shakes hands and all of that. Then it's George's turn and George just turns and looks at him and said, I thought you said it was Mel Brooks. 
Mel Gibson's jaw just hit the ground and George said, don't worry, I know who you are. <laughs> but that, that, that's, the way, that's, that's the way he was. It's just, he was an amazing individual. He, he could give two hoots about uh, the business, really. It, it's, he always used to get pissed off because it was always George Harris, next Beatle. And he, it, that was six years of my life. What about the rest of the stuff? He, he hated be that ex-Beatle being after his name all the time. He, he, oh, he and this solo album did better than any of yes. the other solo yeah. Beatle albums. It did. <laughs> it was, you were not the producer. No, no, uh, you it, were was, it, was, it was he and, yeah, he and Phil. I hadn't moved into a production area at that Phil you know, being. At this point. The Phil, is there anyone else? That Phil Spector. <laughs> yeah. It's he a very, was, he is a very different production style than you. Oh, as it obviously. turns out, yes, yeah. I, my, my first dealing with, with Phil was he came into Trident to, to do a track for his, his wife, Ronnie Spector, and she wasn't there. He, he was down teaching the song to the musicians, the session musicians, and I was upstairs getting the sound, and I got what I thought was typically my sound, and he, he then came up. Musicians started to play, and he he had me change maybe three minor things, and it completely changed from what it would be my normal sound to his. And I've racked my brains, what were those three things? But I've never quite remembered them. But uh, they were very simple. It, it was there was nothing much. But with with all things must pass, the album, uh, the the basic tracks were all cut at uh, Abbey Road by Phil McDonald, and. Phil Spector was there for all of the basic tracks. Uh, then it was only eight track at uh, Tr Abbey Road at that point. Trident, we'd moved to 16 track. And so George came and I did all of the overdubs and then mixed. And during the overdubs, Phil was back in LA. He, he wasn't there for any of the, the, over the months that we spent on the overdubs. Uh, he just came back when it was time for mixing and the way it would go is George and I would turn up about two, three o'clock in the afternoon. We'd get a mix together as close as we thought it should be. Phil would then come in, he'd listen, he'd make suggestions, some of which we'd, we'd do, some of which we, we wouldn't. Phil would go, we'd complete the mix, George would go, I'd set up for the next day, and so it went. So Phil wasn't, Phil wasn't there that much for that. I did have a, an interesting education with him a bit later. As it, as it turns out, it, this made m so much more sense after the trial, or uh, during the trial, uh, than it did when it actually happened. George, Phil and Ronnie Spector came back to Trident later for a song that George had written specifically for Ronnie called Try Some, Buy Some. And we were upstairs in the, the mix room which had a small overdub booth behind us. And we were putting the vocal on. And after we said hello and all of that, Ronnie went in there, I set the mic up, got her to sing, got the sound, and Phil said, okay, let, let's do a take. So we do a take as soon as it's finished and I stop the tape machine. Phil starts to tell us his story, which probably lasted about 20 minutes, and the entire time Ronnie Spector is just standing in front of the mic, not saying a word. And Phil will push the talk back. Okay, Ronnie, yeah, that, that was good. Can we have a little more feeling in the second chorus, maybe? Okay, Phil. I'd recalled. We'd go through again. When it finished, Phil would regale us with another 20-minute story, and Ronnie was just standing there in front of the mic, not saying a word. She was petrified. She was absolutely terrified to even move from the mic or say anything. It be has become clear. Looking back, at the time, I just thought, this is strange. But then everything that came out about Phil afterwards with the trial and all that, it just made so much sense. It's horrible, horrible. Let's move on to a completely different style Please. of music. Um, yeah, a person. <laughs> and a person. Oh, oh let me just, sorry, just yeah. one other thing with regard to All Things Must Pass. Uh, especially that particular track, it, it, it's, it comes out so much. All of the backing vocals, the George O'Hara Smith singers, as it says on the, the, the album, they're all George. It, it was, we spent 
hours and days and weeks doing the backing vocals. And the way we do it is George would go down, he'd put down the first part. We'd put down like four of him doing it. Then we'd be bouncing his four vocals onto another track at the same point he's singing live. Then he'd start to put on the next harmony. And as after we'd put four down, we'd mix the, the first track with the five initial tracks down to that other one with him singing live and just gradually kept on going back. And we'd get something that Nigel brought up uh, during this, uh, the earlier talk that, something that used to happen a lot that doesn't happen now is we would slow the tape machine down so that he could reach the high points and he'd just sing it slower and we'd put it up to normal speed and he'd be up that much higher and that's how all of the backing vocals are done that entire well i'll say the double album because i don't think there are any backing vocals on the last the, the, the third thing and one other quick thing about all things was past i w i was blessed to spend a fair amount of time with george before his passing uh, he contact me, contacted me completely out of the blue and I got to spend quite a bit of time over at Friar Park, his place in England. What was the point I was getting to? Hell, I completely lost it with that. Just, I well, was, one of the things I that I found interesting about you listening back to it uh, is you guys saying probably wouldn't have put so much reverb oh, no. on this well, thing. When we were back if, there, uh, we... we we sat in his studio in front of the board, and now we are playing the, the, the mixes and, and finally some of the multi-tracks of All Things Was Passed because we're working on the reissue of it, the 40th anniversary, whatever it was. And uh, we just look at each other and we burst out laughing and it, the, the, for two reasons. One, it was here we are 40 years on sitting in exactly the same positions, listening to exactly the same tape, something that we thought would be last for a, six months, maybe a year. But here we are 40 years on doing the same thing. And the other thing was just how much reverb there was on it. It was ridiculous. <laughs> we would have loved to have gone back and just remixed it without... despectorize it is, is probably the best phrase. Uh, we actually mentioned it to EMI, but they wouldn't allow us to do it. They said we had to put it out as the original. And I just, I, I really hope that... Uh, it doesn't happen without George being around. There's there's always that possibility if there's more buck more bucks involved. But uh, the, the, I suddenly re remembered what point I was getting to. George, whilst we were doing all of this, had the idea of why don't we put another CD as part of the package? And what we'll do is we'll interview everyone that uh, played a part in the recording of All Things Was Pass. And, and yeah, great idea, George. Okay. And it just so happened I was flying back to LA the, the following week and he said, Ringo's there at that point. Why don't you go over and sit down with Ringo and do the first interview and find out what he remembered about it and record it? I said, great, fine, okay. I flew back to LA, contacted Ringo's home, set up an appointment, went over there, set up the recorder in the garden. Ringo came out and after some small talk, okay, Ringo, so what do you remember about recording All Things Must Pass? Did I play on that? <laughs> no one remembers anything about the recording. And it, it I, maybe with some of them it was too much drugs or whatever, but uh, the majority of it is just, we never ever thought that we would be talking about those recordings this, this far on. It, recordings back then, artists recording deals back then were they had to do an album every six months. Now, obviously, the Beatles were slightly different, but uh, it was still, we made records that we thought people would be interested, if people were interested in it for six months until the next album came out, then we'd done our job. It was, we never, ever thought 40 years on, 50 years on, we'd be talking about this. So it was just another day at the office kind of thing. It's, we, there's a lot of, a lot of stories that have just, completely dis disappeared from, from our psyche. It's, I actually, as has been commented, I did a book last year, I think it was, it came out, and there was one story I really, really wanted to try and get into the book because I'd been asked about it so many times. I was the engineer when uh, Eric Clapton came in to play the guitar solo on While My Guitar Gently Weeps. I have been asked about that so many times because it became part of uh, Beatles history. It was the first time 
an outside musician had come in and actually played with the band. And I don't remember a damn thing about it. Nor do I've spoken to my second engineer. I've spoken to the maintenance engineer. I spoke to Chris Thomas about it. None of us remember it. It wasn't that important. But for the book, I wanted to try and get the story in there. So I actually went into regression therapy, uh, hypnosis, to try and bring back some of those memories that I'd forgotten. And it, it didn't work this time around. But I'm going to do it again, and it will be volume two. Volume two. <laughs> uh... Let's go in a slightly different direction for the next tune. This is uh, Billy Cobham off of Spectrum. Correct. With Tommy Bowen on guitar. Um, jazz fusion is pretty far from Elton John, David Tell Bowie, me about it. the Beatles. What drew you to this, this music? Oh, well, the way I got into it we go back to the Chateau uh, recording Elton. And at dinner time, either Elton or Gus would always put on some music in the background. And they had this favorite album that both of them kept on putting on. It, it was called Inner Mountain Flame. And it was by a band called Mahavishnu Orchestra that I'd never heard of. And I would catch snippets of, of this album whilst everyone was talking at dinner. And it made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever i was it was it sounded like five junkies all in different rooms just going nuts and i didn't understand it at all so then we come back to to trident to mix and one day i get a phone call from from an a and r guy at cbs and he said, John McLaughlin and Mahavishnu Orchestra are coming over to, to England to do a TV show. And they would like to meet with you with regard to doing the next album. Mahavishnu Orchestra, that's the band that Elton and Gus kept up. Yeah, okay, can you send me a copy of the last album and, and to, for me to listen to and we'll take it from there. So they sent over In a Mountain Flame. And then when I put it on and sat down and actually listened, I was floored. They were fucking amazing. And yes, please, let me meet them. And I, I went, and it, it was a quite remarkable TV show because uh, they came out to, to do a, a, a run-through, and Mahavishnu were one of the loudest bands I've, I've ever heard. And they come out and they play... Instantly, the guys, this was the BBC, the guys came out with, with their volume meters. And, oh, turned out, you've got to turn down, you can't go over, I think it was 99 decibels or something like that, and they were reading 120, and just, you can't play that loud. And John McLaughlin was just... And they continued, they did the sound check with, with everything down. They went, changed, time for the show, they, they came out. Up to 11 for anyone that's seen Spinal Tap. And uh, this cameraman just, it was so loud, he just fell off this camera up there onto the floor. <laughs> it was strange. But uh, anyway, I, we, we got on like a house on fire. What did you think you could bring to there? I had so. absolutely no idea whatsoever. I, I One of the things for the book that I tried to do was my big question was why me because there I was I'd come off the Beatles and uh, Bowie and Elton which was so far away from from what they were doing I have no idea why why I ever was thought of and no one else can quite remember the the own the, the closest I think we got was the fact that their manager was uh, a New York attorney called Nat Weiss who had been connected with the Beatles he, he was I think he was their American attorney and all, all of that. So there may have been a connection there, but I don't know. They wanted, John wanted me. I don't know if I ever actually worked. John used to be a session guy in England, and I don't know if we, we spoke about it, and I don't know if we ever worked together then, but it, I guess it worked because I, I started to, I got my first lesson on American slang from a Polish keyboard player because... We did the first take, and they came up to, to listen. Now, I, I have to say one thing. I mentioned earlier about the buzz, the high of 
great musicians playing together. Well, the, the Birds of Fire album that we finished up doing, it, it was all live in the studio, five absolutely unbelievable musicians playing live in the studio, no overdubs. Oh, what a rush that was. And so anyway, we do the first take, they came up to listen, and... As they're all leaving, Jan Hammer, the, the actually I said Polish, he's Czech, I think, the, the keyboard player came up to me and he said, you're a bad motherfucker. What did I do wrong? Why am I bad? I thought it sounded good. One of the others came up and said, that's good over in America. Don't worry, it's all fine. We listened to the Cobham uh, track because it, it seems like with him especially, you really won him over with the techniques that you were using. He wasn't ex experiencing someone like yourself miking drums in the way that you were. No, they, they came from a jazz background. And the, the first album, In a Mountain Flame, the, the engineer on that, uh, it was the, the typical jazz thing of just a, one or two mics over and not... Over, not that much definition on the drums. And I think that, that's one of the things that I, well, certainly I, I brought to it because I did it the way I was accustomed to, just with a hell of a lot more mics. Uh, I, every tom had its own mic. Uh, each bass drum had its own mic. A couple of overheads, uh, on hi-hat snare. Just my, the typical way I recorded rock and roll. And... Uh, suddenly the, the definition that he was getting on, on the drums, he'd never heard before on their style of, of music. So, yeah, I finished up doing four solo albums with, with Bill. Uh, through him, I got to do three, uh, three albums with Stanley Clark. That led to Happy the Man and Dixie Drakes. And you said in the book that Spectrum, this the one that this came off yep. of, for your to your mind was the first jazz fusion record it, in a it, way. Why do you? Why did you say that? Yeah, I, I can't say it's the first. It, to me, it's the most real fusion record. Uh, McLaughlin is a great technician. He's a he's a great guitarist, but he he still comes from a, a jazz background. It, a lot of John's playing was jazz turned up loud, jazz through a Marshall. Uh, whereas on Spectrum, you've got the, the the drummer and the keyboard player come from a jazz background. The uh, bass player, Lee Sklar, comes from a general session background. He was He's played with, with so many... James Taylor, Carly Simon, uh, Phil Collins, all, all of these type of people. So he was the bass player. And then the guitarist, complete... Rock comes completely from... He was playing with the James Gang, I believe, at that, that point, Tommy Bolan, and he then went on to Deep Purple. But uh, he came completely from the rock background. So it was so much the intermingling of all of the different styles in the studio. Uh, and so that, that, to me, is why it's fusion more than, more than uh, Mahavishnu was. Uh, let's play uh, another track. This is by... Super Tramp. Hmm. So you mentioned, uh, you know, recording the Beatles, Bowie, all these uh, groups, one week for an album or so. Two weeks, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Super Tramp, Crime of the Century. Six months. Why did it take so long? I, we were after something very specific. Uh, it... You were also given license well, by yeah, the record yeah, yeah, company. Yeah, yeah. I know we were. It, it was absolutely astounding. Where where the thing had come from that we're looking for something special, I don't know. But it was it was there at least in my mind, right from day one. I would normally get a drum sound fairly quickly. Uh, I would use the same mics, same positioning, relatively the same EQ. Uh, so I can generally do it quickly. This particular occasion for, for Bob Seidenberg's kit, one and a half days just to get the drum sound. And uh, it continued that way all along. And what transpired, because we were taking so long to, to get things going, come to the two weeks where everyone expected the album to be finished recording, we'd got basic tracks and a 
couple of overdubs, but not many. And we suddenly get this phone call from A&M that Jerry Moss, who was the M of A&M, uh, was in town and wanted to come by and hear what we'd done. And, oh, crap, we haven't got anything to play him. It, we know we're close. And they said, well, he's coming down, so come up with something. So we just did rough mixes of, of what we had. And uh, he came in. He sat down in front of the board at Trident, and we played him what we had. And at the end of it, he got up. Well, thank you. It was very nice. It's, it's good meeting you all. And he left, and we thought, that's it. We're out the door. He's going to kill the whole project. We, we should have done it faster. We almost didn't t even turn up the next day, but uh, as, it's a good job we did because we immediately got a phone call as soon as we set foot in there that he loved everything that he heard and he thought it was going to be an amazing album and that we had as much time and as much money as we needed to complete it the way we had started it. So we got to spend six months of it. And even then, it was a 24-hour session to finish it off. It seems like you, as you said, you knew from the beginning that it was mm. a special and you tried to fit every single thing you could into this album. We experimented a lot on this. It was... Uh, we we didn't want to use standard things that like sound effects. We we used sound effects a couple of times during this, and the the usual way that one chose sound effects was there were lots of records out that had sound that were just sound effects. So you you'd get one of these records, you'd find the effect that you wanted and use that, and everyone used the same ones, and you'd hear the crackles and all of that kind of thing come from it. And just said, we're not doing it that way. We've got to, re any sound effects we want, we have to record them ourselves. So on the, f the opening track, school, there, there are school kids, and we rented a Nagra. I went to the garden of a friend of, uh, friend of ours uh, that was just down the road from a school that my kids were attending. And I went down there at lunch hour when I knew all the kids would be in the playground playing. And I, I set the mics up and recorded the kids and went, went to the studio later on and Roger would go through and listen and find bits that would work and then we'd try it within the track. And much the same, there's another track called Rudy where uh, th there are train sound effects and that was Roger Hodgson and John Halliwell. They took the Nagra that time and went down to... Paddington Station, I think it was, in, in London, and recorded train things. And it, the weird thing, the, the way these things happen, they, uh, whilst they were recording the sounds, there was this announcement for a train that was coming, and it named all the stations it was going to. And it just so happened, and we didn't realise it till after the event, after we'd used this particular part, we suddenly realised it was announcing where Roger was born, where Rick was born, where various members of the band, uh, that's where the train was stopping. And absolutely certainly bizarre. wouldn't have gotten that off of a sound effect, right? No, certainly not. And it, uh, another part, there's a, at the end of the main song of, of Rudy, it goes into this much lower, quieter section, just the strings and, and Rick singing. Uh, maybe piano, I can't remember. But there's a link into it, which is a violin. And most people think that that part was specifically written. It wasn't. As Rick and, uh, as Roger and John were leaving the station, there was this busker outside playing. And they thought, oh, we've got to record this. So they pulled out the, the Nagra again, set it up and recorded this guy playing. And that's what we finished up using. It just worked perfectly between the two parts of the song. It just, and it just all kinds of things. We, we'd walk, I remember walking into a studio... And I immediately got down on hands and knees with a block of wood, and I'm going all over the floor, knocking this piece of wood to find the best place, because there was a song that we knew we wanted a specific wood-hitting-wood sound. And so I was going around trying to find the best place on the floor for it. Any box that would be lying around, we'd start hitting it in all its places. Or That would be good for Dreamer. All of that kind of thing, because we didn't, we didn't have all of the the things that you can get in a computer these days. We had to do everything ourselves. And we, we consciously, I consciously, and persuaded them, uh, didn't want to use regular percussion instruments. Uh, they're, they're on, on Dreamer, there's, there's a part where we would normally have used a tambourine, and I didn't want to do that. It's just too, too normal. So we finished up having uh, Rick with a drum brush and he's just doing that in front of the mic. And when you hear it on it, 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 
all of these things work so much better when you hear just them. You hear the, shh, 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 but you also get this whistle from it, which is amazing, but you don't hear it with everything else going on. We used, uh, on uh, the actual track Crime of the Century, we used something I'd been taught by an incredible English percussionist called Ray Cooper. Something that used to be used in horror movies, apparently. It's called a water gong, and it's either a, a very large gong or a sheet of metal that you, you hit and lower it into a... Generally, it's a fish tank full of water. And as you lower it, it changes pitch. And it's the most amazing sound, and especially when, once again, you hear it on its own. You hear the water bubbling as it goes down. But all of these strange things, and we just knew we had to do it that way, and it worked. Now, I, I, I mentioned earlier on about the most important things are the monitors in the control room. We mixed the album at a studio called Scorpio in London, and they had these speakers. They were built by an English company called Kadak, and they were seven foot tall. They weighed half a ton each. They had something like 25 different speakers in them. How they ever set them up, I've no idea, but they were the most amazing speakers I've ever heard. You could get them so loud, and I'd, I'd like to monitor loudly. Do I ever? Uh, I've only ever found one person monitor louder than me, and that was John Taylor, the bass player of Duran Duran, and I'll swear he was deaf, but he would come in and instantly turn up the monitor full bore. Even I had to leave when he, when he was listening to something. But no, these, these speakers, you could turn them up so loud, and they were so clean and so accurate. They, uh, amazing. Why did, what did, why did you monitor so loud? Was that just force of habit at a certain point? I, yeah, after a period of time, you, you generally, I, I found that when you start off, if you've taken a break from, uh, for a while from, from recording, I always start off, I'll, I'll start the monitoring low, and as you work through the days, it creeps up and creeps up till the end, it's, it's, it's loud, and you're obviously mixing at the end, so it, it's really loud for the mixing. Uh, it just... I like, these days, it's more because I like to feel it than, than anything else. It's, if, if it's not hitting me here, it's not loud enough. Or I've done something wrong. I don't have, it, have the mix right, but uh, I, I have to feel it. Let's play uh, one last tune and talk about this uh, stage of your career before opening it up to questions. Interesting choice of track. It's not the one that most people know. Is it? Um, well, I chose it for a reason because uh, I found it really interesting that after being a producer for a long time, making a name for yourself, becoming a big wig, you decide to get into management I, you, with this band specifically. I, and this track was the one track that I feel like broke it to the labels because it was the most well, requested. Well, yeah, on, yeah. Uh, the, the way it went. In typical Hollywood fashion, when I moved over to L.A., I happened to rent a house that was opposite Frank Zappa's house. I had no idea. I found out the first day. My, I dropped my family off. I was, I was working during the day at A&M Studios. I had to finish off a project, and we were mixing, so just during it, doing it during the day. I dropped my family off at the house that we were renting to have all the power turned on on the phone and all of that kind of thing. Dropped them off. I went to work. When I'd finished, I went back, expecting all the power and everything to be on, and the whole house is dark and it's locked, and I don't know where my family are. And I'm sitting in the car, this was before cell phones, and I'm getting madder and madder and madder. I was fuming, and suddenly there's a knock on the car window, and it's one of my daughters, and she said, Hi, Daddy. Hi. Do you know someone called Frank Zappa? Yes. Oh, well, this is his daughter, Moon. Uh, we're at his house. It's just over there. And, oh, only I could have such luck. <laughs> and, and so I, I became friendly with, with the Zappers and went to one of their shows uh, in L.A., or one of Frank's shows, and I became completely enamored of the drummer that he had at that point, a drummer by the name of Terry Bozio. And after the show, I was telling Frank and Gail, his wife, just, he's fucking amazing. Where did you find him? I'm just talking about him and raving about him. 
So they knew my my, uh, my love of Terry's playing. One Saturday afternoon, I get a phone call from from Gail, and she says. Terry, his wife, and another of, of Frank's musicians, a, a guitarist by the name of Warren Cucurillo, are up here, and they've just formed this band. Uh, and Frank thinks that you might like it. Can I send them down? And I said, sure. By this time, I'd moved, and I, I was like five minutes away from Frank at this point. And they came down, and they pulled out this boom box, and they played me these ta- this cassette that... Uh, it was absolutely atrocious. It was awful. But there was there was something that I've got to see this through. I've got to see it further. And so I said, okay, now let me come and see you play live. And they weren't playing live. They were only rehearsing. So I went down to the rehearsal place and heard them play. And once again, it was still so amateurish. It was ridiculous. But once again, I, it's... And whether it was just because I knew what Terry was capable of and I wasn't seeing that. Maybe that's what pushed me on, but whatever it was, I kept going and kept going. We worked together. We went into Frank's studio uh, and cut some demos, which finished up being masters. Uh, Frank let you use that studio for I, a very specific purpose. Oh, yes. I I, <laughs> I am... I used to be. I don't think I'm as bad now. But uh, I had a reputation for finding every single damn fault there is in a studio. Uh, and Frank had just had this studio built. He was on the road. And he wa- knew he wanted to start recording as soon as he got back off the road. So if he were going into the new studio, there would be lots of faults. And he didn't want to have to deal with those. So he let us use it, knowing I'd find every damn fault in that studio, have it fixed before he came back off the road. That's how we got to use the studio. So we, we re- recorded this. I then did the rounds. I think we hit every label in L.A. three times. Uh, labels in England twice. We even hit a couple of labels in Australia. And um, Just rejection after rejection after rejection. We finished up deciding to, to put the record out on our own. And we put out uh, a four-song EP, which is a 45, but with, with four songs on it. And it's just cut a little quieter. So this comes out. We start pushing. The, 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 the band are playing out live by this time. Every time they play, we get a bigger audience. We're moving up like mad in the live scene in L.A. And we also happen to be played on... The, the biggest radio station in, in L.A. for breaking new acts. Uh, it was K-Rock, K-R-O-Q. We're starting to do really well, but we're still not really seeing anything from, from record companies or anything, and we're selling quite well with this, with our self-promoted uh, EP. And then finally, we get to play uh, the Santa Monica Civic, which is a 2,000-seater, I think it is, something like that, and we sell out. And it just so happened, this was round about the end of the year, and K-Rock has their countdown of the most requested records of the year. We're going down, and we go through two of the, the songs off of the EP, and we think, oh, this is great. And we get to the top three, and we think, oh, that's it. We're not, we're not going to hear any more of our songs on it, and it just so happens that uh, that track was just played, finished up being the most requested record of the year. Guess what? We suddenly get a record deal. It was terrible. It wasn't. It wasn't a good record deal in any way, shape, or form. But it was the only one in town, and it was with Capitol Records. So, of course, we signed it. We finish up. They want to reissue the 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 EP with uh, the change of one song. They wanted another song on it, which we went in and and did. And they put it out on a 12-inch. And it became the biggest-selling 12-inch record ever, from what I was told at that point, anyway. Uh, So we were shopping around for management. We were finding exactly the same thing as we found. We're trying to find a record deal. We had one, one manager that was interested... And he was Tina Turner's manager. And he wanted Dale, the lead singer, he didn't want the band. God, 
what an idiot. But because uh, all of the talent, quite honestly, was the band. Dale, Dale was a unique front person, but nothing more. Uh, it, it, they needed someone to manage them, and so finally, for me, it was put up or shut up. I, I turned. I would. I had virtually been doing that anyway, uh, so I just turned to them and said, "Look, I'll manage you." And they said, "Fine." And so I finished up managing them for a year, year and a half. We sold. We completed the album. We we sold eight hundred thousand units, I think it was, and. Uh, what was the that, most important thing that you learned as a manager during the, that time? That management can be as artistic as playing and as as an engineer and as a musician and a producer. It, 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 I loved management. It just it, it's not it, the way I handled it anyway. The way I looked at it, it's not just about the money and setting up to us and all that that, that, that you can get creative with it we got very creative it, it, was, it was very much a hands-on we were all sort of hands-on and it was it was the merchandising we were coming up with with dresses and things like that which at that point had, had never been done uh, just all of these kind of things uh, it just it was an artistic say but in a totally different way and there, there were there were other things which were more just in in my keeping that I feel that uh, you always have to keep the audience and the fans in mind. They're the ones that propel you to where you are. You ca you shouldn't rip them off or anything like that. They're vitally important. And there was a situation we we played Long Beach Arena, which was eighteen thousand, I think, on a New Year's Eve, and. By this time, we'd farmed out our merchandising to, to a company. And the the guy that ran it, Burt Ward, who used to play uh, Robin in Batman and Robin TV series, uh, he called me and he said, well, we've, we've got the offer from Long Beach. They, they want, uh, I think it was, they wanted 60% of everything that was sold. I said, you've got to be fucking joking. We're not going to give them. We're paying for everything to be made. We're getting it down there. We're not going to give them 60% for selling it. They'll, they'll come down. He said, okay, fine. This was maybe two months before the gig. Cut to a month. Well, they dropped to 50%. I said, no way. I said, 20%. I'll let them have that. Okay, okay. Three weeks. They've come down to 40%. I told you 20%. Oh, you, look, I, th I think you should go for the 40%. 20%, Bert. Okay. We're getting up closer and closer and closer. And we're a few days away. And he calls me up and he says, well, they're not going to budge from 40. They say you are going to do what every other band does. And that you're back down at the last minute and just jack up the price. So that you still come out with the same amount of money. And I said... I don't work that way. We're going to stick to the same price and they take 20% or we'll, be, we'll bring our own people in and sell outside. He said, okay. The day of the show, they back down to 20%. I felt so fucking good. <laughs> it was amazing. But uh, no, it, it, unfortunately, too often, one, once someone becomes popular, it, yeah, okay, they're, they're fans, they can afford it. I'm sorry, it, it's, it's bull crap. There's, there's an, enough money to go around and the people that you shouldn't rip off are those ones that are paying the money for you, to you, through merchandising, through record sales, through all of this. They're, they're the important ones out there, the fans. You always have to bear them in mind. One last story uh, before we open up for uh -oh. questions. The after party. Oh, I knew this was coming. <laughs> How graphic can I get in my language? Feel free to get as graphic as you want. Oh, jeez. So, I said about San, the Santa Monica Civic and we'd sold out. Well, but before the, the gig, we, we'd actually got the, the record deal. We, we'd, we'd sold out the, the full house. And the record company saw that, and we got the deal very quickly after that. So that we, it comes time for the, for the show. I thought, hell, we've got a record deal. We've sold out Santa Monica Civic. It's We should celebrate. Let's do it after the show. So 
I organised this this party at my house for after the show, and we knew that it wasn't going to start till one o'clock in the morning because the, by the time the band get out of the gig and all of that. So I send letters around to all of the neighbours, telling them we're going to have a party. It's going to start at one o'clock. So if if you want to go to a hotel for the night or something, you've got fair warning. Fine. A lot of people did that. So it comes time for the party, and uh, our estimate was that at, uh, at varying times through the party, we probably had about 200 people in the house at any given time. We had DJs, we had press, we had the band, we had other quote-unquote celebrities, we had the record company people. Uh, it was packed. So I'd, I'd set it up so that there was a, a disco kind of thing outside and people could dance. And then there was the pool. <laughs> so we're about an hour and a half into the party and there's a knock on the door. I go and there are a couple of police there. Now, I have all... I, up, <laughs> up to this point, I had a strict non-drugs in the house thing. I knew for this party with with people coming, there was no way I could control the drug situation. So I knew there was a lot going on. So when I see police at the front, it's panic. And everyone behind me panicked as well that saw. So suddenly there's everyone dashing to the bathroom, pouring stuff down and flushing the toilet. And I'm holding the police there as long as possible. And I, I, they say, uh, excuse me, are you the owner of this property? Well, yes, officer, I am. Well, we've had complaints about the noise. I said, you've got to be ridiculous. You've got to be kidding. I sent out letters telling everyone, everyone knew. The whole and they said, well, I'm sorry, sir, but we've had reports of noise. And, oh, no, can we come in? And by this time, I think everyone sort of cleared everything up. I said, sure. Come out. I take them out the back. They hear the music and they say, I'm afraid you're going to have to turn it down. I said, oh, come on, officer. You're going to have to turn it down. I go over. I turn it down. They leave. Of course, as soon as they leave, I go and turn it back up again. Half an hour later, three quarters of an hour later, it's the same two police officers. I said, oh, come on, guys, you, you saw me turn it down. They said, no, we've had more complaints. You saw me turn it down. Sir, I'm sorry, can we come out and check again? I said, oh, okay, come in. As we're walking through, they, they say, what, what's this party in for? I said, well, I manage a band called Missing Persons, and one of them immediately says, Missing Persons? Is, that has the girl that wears the, the fish bowls on her tits, right? I said, yes, that's the band. <laughs> said, oh, wow, can we get her autograph and anything? I said, sure, yeah, of course, we can arrange that, but let's go out and sort out the sound first. So they go out there and said, sorry, Mr. Scott, it, it, it's not good enough. I said, but you saw me turn it down, guys. Said, no, it's too quiet. Can you turn it up? <laughs> okay. I go over and I turn it up, take them in. I take them over and introduce them to Dale Bozio, the, the singer with the band, the girl that wears the fish bowls on her tits, and leave them talking to her. And I go into the office, which is at the front of the house, and I get posters, I get T-shirts, I get the whole thing, and I go out and give them to, to the cops. that They get Dale's autographs on it, and they leave happy as clams. So now we're, we're at about dawn, I think, 5.30 in the morning, and most people have left. There are just a few friends, close friends. And we decide, okay, there's nothing better than having a good stiff drink in your hand in the jacuzzi and watch the sun come up. So that's what we, we do. We all go put our swimming costumes on. We go out. Oh, well, first off, I go out to turn the jacuzzi on. I go out there, and there's this guy in the pool and he's sitting at the side. He's got his head on his, on his hands with this huge grin on his face. And I just sort of look at him and I continue and I go and turn the jacuzzi on and I'm looking at him strangely as I go in. We all get changed. We go, we get in the jacuzzi. And he's still there with this huge grin on his face. We, we couldn't puzzle out what the hell was going on. We just left him alone. We finish, go in and... We, we get dressed, and I go out to turn everything off. And he's still there, but by now, he doesn't have a grin on his face. And I go over to him and say, what the hell's going on? 
My balls are stuck in the suction. <laughs> I beg your pardon? <laughs> My nuts are in the suction. I just ran into the house and just told him, he says he's got his nuts stuck in the... They said, oh, no, no one believed. We all went running out and one guy hadn't changed yet. He was still in his swimming trunks. So he jumps in, he said, I'll prove if he's stuck or not. He puts his arms around the, guy, around the guy's shoulders, puts his feet up at the side of the pool and kicks back. I have never heard such a loud scream of agony in my life. And he, the, the friend just stands up and said, he's stuck. <laughs> what the hell do you do in a situation like that? 911. So, 911? Yeah, that's it, isn't it? Yeah. I'm suddenly thinking English 999 for a minute there. So uh, I go in and I call. I need a uh, fire department, paramedics. Uh, they put me through it. Uh, see, yes, I, I have this gentleman. He's in my pool and he tells me that his testicles are beep, 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 beep. <laughs> I'm done it again. I, I, I need the fire department, paramedics. Hi, I, I just called and I, th I think we got cut off. I, I have this gentleman in the pool and his, his testicles are stuck in the beep, 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 beep. Oh, Christ. So I go out. They won't listen. They keep on hanging up on me. My wife at the time uh, could be very loud-mouthed, let me put it that way. And she goes in, she gets on the phone. You assholes, don't fucking hang up on me. I've got this guy with his nuts stuck in the pool and you've got to fucking get over here immediately. Of course, they don't hang up. Five minutes later, there's a knock on the door and I go and there are three of the biggest guys I've ever seen in my life in full firefighting regalia with the hats up to here. And I'm just looking up and they say, we've heard something about someone stuck in the pool. I say, yes, he's out here. Come, in, come out. I lead them out, they look. They go over to the corner and they're talking and one of them comes back and he says, I'm afraid we're gonna to have to break the concrete. My wife, in her typical manner, you can break his fucking balls off before you break my concrete. <laughs> so I, always being the, the gentleman, there, there has to be another way, sir. <laughs> they look at each other and they say, do you have any Vaseline? Yes, in the kids' bathroom. I go running in, I come out with this tub of Vaseline. I have never seen such a funny sight in my life as this one seven-foot guy in full fire firefighting regalia on his knee rubbing Vaseline on this guy's nuts. <laughs> they managed to get him out. And because of that event, sometimes there's publicity that you, you lap up, you get it, it's just amazing and you you can never plan it and for this we, we actually made all of the uh, American newspapers we made three English newspapers and it just so happened that, that one of the uh, girls that was at the party she was the cousin of my assistant she happened to be the weather girl for the, the number one DJ in, in LA at that time uh, Rick Dees and she she did his show every morning and she took the, this kid home with her. He, he was a gate crasher from up the street. She took this kid home with her. And she was, every morning on the Rick D show, at some point during it, she would say how his bruises were healing or getting worse. So we got that. The final thing to the story is that just as I'm seeing the, the firefighters off in their fire truck down the road, a police car comes up. And it's the same two cops as had come up the twice before. And I go over to them, they wind the window down. I say, come on, guys, we stopped the music hours ago. What the fuck? And they, well, we were just down the road having breakfast and we heard this call that someone had got stuck in the pool and it was the same place we'd been to all night. So we just had to come and see if it was true. And I just, yes, it's true. Oh, we can't wait to get to the station to tell this story. <laughs> That's the story, after-party story. Thank you very much. <laughs> Should we open it up to questions? Oh, yeah, we got that part. <laughs> Jeez. The part I love, I have to say, so fire at me if you can. Y 
Big pleasure, sir. It's an honor. Me too. Well, thank you. Uh, I was just talking with my friend here. Uh, oh, it was you that I heard whilst I was telling the story that was interrupting me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you probably probably heard this before, but uh, I read in some place, I don't know how accurate it, it is, this study, but it's about brain waves and professions. And this group of neuroscientists uh, are analyzing uh, every prof uh, every field of actuation and uh, the the brain activity that more resembles that of a monk on on a meditation or a meditative. Uh, it, it is. Uh, that of a um, mixing engineer, and I can really relate with wow. this. Uh, in some ways, I don't. I like to hear your thoughts about it. I don't know. I have absolutely no idea whatsoever. It, 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 uh, I, I really can't. I, it, I become totally immersed in it. So I, I, I can only assume that just. As, as they're concentrating on whatever it is they're concentrating on whilst whilst they're doing that, it, it could be similar. But I, with the volume I monitor at, I just somehow it <laughs> doesn't seem to ring true. But uh, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, the one thing on. you mentioned in the book, though, that reminds me of this is when you were doing early mixes on songs and you were concentrating so hard on one thing and oh. people would come in and be like, oh, can you you know, fix the guitar, and you're like, hold yeah, on, I'm uh, doing the drums right now. Oh, yeah. I, it, and I guess it does take that sort of focus, meditation, <sighs> concentration. I, I guess it's, it's that kind of thing that, uh, for a, a period of time, I, I refused to have the artist there when I mixed. Uh, and and it, that came from, when working with David, he was, he didn't like the studio, so he didn't come to mixes. So I got to do it all on my own, and I got used to doing it on my own, so I like to continue it that way. Then, finally, uh, I, I, I let people come in on the mix. But if you, if you let the musician in too early, it's, it's always the drummer always wants to hear more drums. The uh, guitarist always wants to hear more guitar. The bass player always wants to hear more bass. Uh, so they will tend to come in, you're, uh, as you were saying, I'll just be setting up the drums, and the bass player will come in, oh, I think you need more bass, but I'm only listening to the drums. Oh, oh, okay, I'll keep quiet. You keep going a bit longer, then the guitarist comes in, oh, I can't hear the guitar. No, I'm working on the drums. That, so I, I tend to keep the musicians out and to, I, I like to get it the, the way it worked with, with George and I with, with Spectre. It was take it to that point where it's pretty damn close. And at that point, you can allow people to come in and make suggestions uh, and either accept the suggestions or not. So th there might be a certain amount of that, of the, the concentration that's involved. But also with, within mixing, I like to take lots of breaks. It, it's go through it three or four times, then I'll take a break for five minutes, go and have a cup of tea or something. I, I just, so I, I'm not putting that out there sort of a, as long as uh, most people will meditate. There's a, a, a George story. We were working on, uh, he did soundtrack for a movie called Wonder Wall, and we were working on that, and he would disappear for an hour every day. And myself and the second, we had no idea where he went. It, it turns out he went into this small closet almost uh, every day for an hour, and he would <laughs> meditate in there. We finally found out where he was going. But uh, So I understand that meditation thing, but I never concentrate for that long. So I wish I could. I can't. By the way, Savoy Truffle is my favorite one from uh, every oh. Beatles I don't it, it, the, the story of that with George, once again, is we were... George Martin went on vacation for uh, a good few weeks whilst we were doing the White Album. He went to the Greek islands. And he came back when George... came back into the studio when George and I were actually mixing Subway Truffle. And the, the Beatles, they went through fads. And 
whilst doing the White Album, they went through this whole thing where they'd just come in and when we're going to mix, they'd say, okay, we want full bass and full treble on every track. Okay, they're the Beatles. You don't argue. You turn full bass and full treble on, on every track. And that's how we'd mix it. That was the standard EQ for some of their mixing. And that, it was that way on, on Savoy Truffle. And George Martin came in and he said to George, uh, I think it sounds rather toppy, don't you, George? That's the way I like it, and it's going to stay that way. And George just George Martin just turned around and walked out. And <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. Hello. Hi. Um, I was wondering, some of the um, work that you've done has a certain soothing quality in it, and whether as the producer or recording engineer, what you do to achieve that and how to re-engineer that when, like, let's say in the America situation, you had to go and redo a track after the whole thing was fair. I didn't do that. I didn't do Horse With No Name, uh, oh, which was the one that was, it was, just to explain briefly, I, I did the first America album and when it was handed in to Warner Brothers, I think it may have been Warner Brothers US, I think it was put out without... Horse with no name to start with, and then one of the Warner Brothers, either England or the US, said, "We need a, another song. We need a single." And so they went back into another studio and recorded a horse with no name, and then it was put on the album, and it then became very successful. Uh, soothing. I, I <laughs> there are very few tracks that I've done that I care to think of as soothing, especially with the monitoring level that I listen to most of the stuff. Uh, I, I I work from the gut completely. It, it's I I I don't know what I do most of the time. It, it I it's it all comes down to here and here, as far as I'm concerned. You could you could take six engineers, put them in exactly the same situation with the same musicians, the same mic positions, everything's identical. And the six engineers will each come out with a totally different sound because we all hear things differently, we all do things differently. And it, it, a lot of it is something you can't teach. It, it's something that I guess you, could, you can learn, train yourself to do. Uh, just with experience. It's, it's my experience working with the Beatles. That, that, I, I learnt what works for me, and that's what I do. But a lot of it, I can't even explain what it is. It's just what feels right. And sometimes it can be very silly, like knowing that I had to work with missing persons. It was something in here that kept me going with them. And finally, they, it, other people around, other people around me that had said, "You've got to be nuts. Why are you giving up a good production career to manage this band?" And they're shit. There was just something within me that knew it would work, uh, and it j it's been that way all along. With with Supertramp, why the hell, why with them did I suddenly decide? Okay, I'm going to spend more time and get it right. I've I've no idea why I do half of what I do, and it just comes naturally, and uh, I just go with the flow. When Nigel was saying earlier that he found his sweet spot for oh, yeah. EQs and all yeah. of these things. Is that something that you related to as well? Absolutely. It's... I will use this... Whenever possible, I use the same mics all the time. And uh, normally the EQ is, is, is basically, basically the same. I'm a firm believer that uh, the sound starts in the studio, in the recording room, not in the control room. Uh, everything happens in the studio, from the sound to the performance. And we in the control room are there just to put the icing on the cake, it just give that little bit of sparkle to it. Uh, I, I don't believe that you can take a, an OK sound in the studio and through the use of plugins or whatever, make a great sound. And there, some of the some of the stuff that Nigel does is, is that does happen. It, 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 it's the type of music that I do. I I have done it. It, it happens in the studio so much more. Uh, I'm not dealing with with 
the electronic side of stuff as, as much as he does. Uh, no, it, it's everything for me is, is in the studio. So if the sound is there in the first place in the studio, I don't have to do much. So the EQ that I use is minimal. I, I did some sessions with my co-writer of the book, Bobby Ozinski. Uh, he was producing a, a band. And he's, he's worked with virtually all of the big names in L.A., he couldn't believe how little I did to get the sound. Uh, so many of, of the big names in LA will come in with these huge racks of, of outboard gear and they have to use everything that's in them. And me, I'll, I'll use... I'll use a universal audio uh, compressor. I, I will use one, one echo, one, one reverb. Uh, and just a little EQ. I, I don't need lots of effects. Uh, it, too much EQ because it's all it's readily there in the studio. I've got this. I've got the musician to the point of the the sound there that I don't have to affect it. Are there any other questions? Um, yeah. Oh. Like, yeah, oh. I mean, you partly um, answered the question that I had in mind, like uh, getting the best performance uh, out of uh, out of the artists in order to maybe, you know, save on time then with mixing or be like uh, quicker with a good result. Well, to me, that 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 part of it, it all comes down to decision making. I started off on four track, which uh, Nigel said earlier ab about we would have to record sort of everything onto one track. You had to determine right up front what the record was going to sound like. So are right you a fan the of beginning. limitation then? Or are you a fan no, of... I'm a f yeah, no, it doesn't have to be limitation. Just make up your mind. 191 tracks of a guitar solo that eventually are going to have to be sorted out sometime down the line. Do it when you're recording. If it takes 191 times, that's fine. I, I won't argue with that, but... You, you, you must have seen how every time there is new technology, the record companies will reissue the record in a new format. And especially like with, with surround sound, records that have been mixed in stereo, suddenly another engineer will get hold of the, the masters and mix for surround. Imagine what it's going to be like 20 years down the line when suddenly someone gets all of these Pro Tool files and there's 191 guitar solos. What the hell is he going to do? That's always assuming the hard drives exist, still work in 20 years down the line, that we can still get that out of them. But it, it's, there is no reason for it. That You can keep a couple of things. The amount that I've seen uh, that people have saved every single time, it's ludicrous. You know when it's the one or not. Or but you I'm, should know when it's the one or not. But I mean, a, a, lot, a lot of things must have changed, let's say, from the Beatles to Duran Duran or something like this. Like, would that like be something that you embrace, like that you can do more afterwards? Like, would you embrace technology? Or would you like think back of the time when decisions were made at the spot? For, for me, it, it, it's, it's both. I, I like both analog and digital. In my ideal world, I will use both. I will start off recording on analog and then transfer it to Pro Tools so that I can use what I need to use, what is really good about Pro Tools. Uh, so I, I will certainly embrace modern technology, but all too often, we as humans, it's all or nothing. It, it's We will... If it's new, we've got to have it, and we've got to c totally embrace it and forget what's, what's back there. One of the reasons that I enjoy talks like this, and I, I go around to universities and talk to students, is that thing of we don't have to lose everything from back then. There is no reason for it. There, there were The whole thing of, of recordings back then worked because... There, there were lots of good points about it. And why don't we just use modern technology to improve on that same principle and just keep going? And making decisions is, is one of them. And it's not just the music industry. It, it's in life in general. We've reached the point no one likes to make a decision. I, I use the, the thing of going into a supermarket and you, you walk past and there's a guy on the cell phone, honey, 
but there are a hundred different kinds of baked beans. Now, which baked beans is it you want me to get? It's absurd, they're baked beans. You're not gonna die if you take the wrong ones. Well, she might kill you or she might injure you, but it's not that bad. Unless you're doing brain surgery or maybe flying a plane, it, decisions aren't gonna hurt. I, and the, the, the minutia that we have now gotten into, and I've been guilty of it myself in the past, absolutely. But I've never known a record become successful because the, the hi-hat's 2 dB higher or 2 dB lower. It, it, it works or it doesn't. It's just get the feeling out there. Get a great song. Get a great performance. And everything else falls into place. Thank you. Hey, uh, probably you already answered this, but uh, you mentioned a little bit that uh, like current music or modern music is made through like a mental process and not like a feeling or by heart process. I was like thinking, is there any like a specific reason that current musicians are not doing that previous? Well, so to a certain extent, I think it's uh, been forced upon them by major labels. It, the, the, the use of auto-tune these days it's almost you have to do it if you want the record released by a major label. It's ludicrous. It's people that know nothing about music. Uh, they're only interested in three months down the line. The, the quarterly reports are in the black, not in the red. That's the extent of, of their knowledge. It's money, money, money. And I, I was just down in Nashville with, with my wife and we were sitting down talking to a guitarist and vocalist and he'd recorded an album and he had done all of the vocals and refused to use auto-tune, refused to use it. And then finally, it, he backed down and it, it was, I'm gonna have, to, he took the two most commercial tracks and used auto-tune on it because people, he, he feels that people now expect it. And that's all th from major labels. And it, it, there is so much that I find is taught in these recording schools where it, it's all computer, all computer. I, I put out uh, a product called Epic Drums EDU. I, I put out something, a drum software, a, a drum sample library called Epic Drums that I got together with five drummers that I'd worked with in the past. Uh, Billy Carbum, Terry Bozio, Woody Woodmansey of, of Bowie Spiders from Mars, uh, Bob Seidenberg from Supertramp, and Rod Morgenstein from Dixie Dregs. And we recreated drum sounds and loops from records that we'd done in the past. I, I realized in doing that that there was an educational side to it where there are a lot of engineers these days that have never actually recorded real drum. Uh, have never recorded live drums. So all, uh, most of the samples these days are real drums, but uh, have never actually worked with a kit in the studio. So many of them haven't, it's just all samples. And so I, I got together with the publisher of my book and we put out something called Epic Drums EDU, which one part of it is a DVD of me showing how I, I record drums, but the other part of it, which is what I initially went in to, to put out, it, it's, three and a half to four minute multi-track recordings of these drummers, uh, them playing grooves for uh, three and a half to four minutes, which are all multi-tracks. So someone that's never recorded real drums, live drums, keep on doing that, live drums, uh, can learn the problems, like the leakage of, of cymbals into tom mics and how you deal with that and all of that kind of thing. You can practice without taking studio time. You can do it on your laptop. You can do it else, wherever you want to. But it's, it's a way of sort of teaching the more of the old style kind of thing. And it's with some of the greatest drummers in the world. But I, I've seen these people coming out of, of schools. I, I did a project a couple of years ago now up in Seattle. And my, my assistants, there, there were two, they both went to recording school and the immediate thing, we'd recorded drums and their immediate reaction was they started to move everything around onto the grid. I said, no, you, you don't, it, it has to be human. Every drummer is different. It, it's, it, 
only a couple of sort of milliseconds between where the drummer hits the snare is what makes the difference between one one feel of a drummer and the feel of another. I learned so so much on what, watching one show. Uh, Ziggy, the, the first track, Five Years, starts off with, with drums fading up. Same drum pattern all the way through the song and then finishes it with the drums fading down. Uh, played by Woody Woodmansey. I had moved over to LA and I went and saw, and I, and I was totally used to Woody playing the way he does. Moved to LA, went and saw Bowie play live and it was the first time I'd seen him play with other musicians and it was an American drummer. And he played exactly the same as, as Woody played, but the feel was totally different. It was just the milliseconds difference between where he hits the bass drum, where he hits the snare, made all the difference in the world between them. And that's something, if you just move things onto the grid, suddenly it, it, everyone's the same. It loses its humanity. It, it, it becomes robotic because everything sounds the same. You take something like Honky Tonk Women, uh, the Rolling Stones thing, if you check the tempo at the beginning of it and check the tempo at the end of it, it goes like that during the, the whole song. But it feels amazing. These days, that wouldn't be allowed. It would all be put to the grid. It's, there's nothing wrong with being human. We start off in the womb, we're hearing a heartbeat, and a heartbeat doesn't go at the same rate all the time. That's where we start, and we just go from there. It sh we need humanity back in music. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, thank you. A pleasure to meet you. And thank pleasure you for the overtime here. back then and all this great music. Um, I was wondering, like, um, you mentioned the six-month time frame that usually, you know, uh, it, it took, like, new records to be released back then. Now it's a slightly different time frame, like, ranging between a year and a half to maybe for... Because people don't want to make decisions. Okay, so, um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about that, about the decisions of a debut album of beginning with a sound or letting it go and then beginning with making decisions and then go taking it from there to the next record and the next record. Like, yeah, about, about that more. I, I believe in teamwork. I, I don't, I think everything comes from a great team. I think the team, the, 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 the teamwork of the Beatles and George Martin, it was, they, they knew what they had to, what they had to do. Now, eventually, the Beatles pulled away from George. They, they grew, they, they, they wanted to do different things than George necessarily wanted to do. Uh, but there are very few artists, as far as I'm concerned, that can produce themselves. Uh, most people need that outside ear to... to I, I went through something. There was a BBC interview that, that Bowie did once where he was asked about working with me. And he, he said that I was his George Martin, which at the time I took exception to because I hadn't realised exactly how much I'd learned from George Martin. And in, I started to think about it and, and finally I realised that uh, what I as a producer do is allow the talent in the studio to do what talent has to do, and that's create. Uh, always knowing that if they try and go too far afield, I can always sort of, hey guys, you know what? It was better when you were doing it before, and nudge them back. And that's the way George worked with the Beatles, with, with so much of the stuff he did. And I, I picked that up, so then finally I realized what a compliment uh, David was playing me, uh, paying me by calling me George Martin. Right. Now to try to get to that, it, it's a band, an act normally knows what it's trying to put across. If, well, too many bands these days are forming to, uh, to get a record deal and to become famous. They're not forming to make good music. The bands that are there to make good music 
know what direction they want to go. They, they know what they want to put across. And then get the, it, it's up to finding the, putting the team together, the, the right producer that feels the same way as them. And, and the decisions are, are easy. It, it's, they know the road they want to travel. And it might, might sell, it might not sell. But if you're doing it to make good music, not to sell records, it doesn't matter. You've got something out of it in the end. And unfortunately, these days, you might not get the second chance for the second album if it doesn't sell. Uh, at least that used to happen in, in the, the good old days. Uh, with... with Things like this, Red Bull Academy, I think that the, the chance of getting a second chance is much stronger. That, that they seem, what I have got out of being here today is how much into, into the music they are and, and the creativity of artists. It, it's the way it, it used to be back in the Renaissance period. Everyone had to have someone that was giving them the money so that they could exist, so they could create their art. And I almost get that feeling it's not giving the money, but it's giving the opportunity here at, at all of the Red Bull Academies throughout the world. And it's, if you're, if you're there for making good music, you, the decisions are easy. It's, and if you've got the right team with you, you're all heading in the right direction, in the same direction. And so, in, instinctively, you will know the best take. That there are some musicians. There was something that that Nigel hit on earlier. There, there are musicians. There was a, a sax player, an incredible sax player, that uh, I work with, Michael uh, Michael Be uh, Michael Brecker. I, I I work with him on a Bill Bill Carbum album, and Bill told me get him first take. Okay made sure we, we recorded him properly on the first take. And he said, OK, now I've, I've got the feel for it. Uh, let's do another one. And Bill said to me, OK, do it on another track. OK, did it on another track. Mike, after doing that, said, oh, no, no, that wasn't the one. OK, I know I can do better. And um, we kept, I think we probably did another eight takes. None were as good as that first take. And um, um, Cobham knew he'd worked with, with Michael Brecker enough. He, he knew. It will be the first take. That's the best one always with him. It was that outside voice that kind of knew, knew that, which was great because I would have put him on the same track and we, it would have just gone downhill really fast. So uh, it, it, If a band has played together for a while, someone within that band will know how good someone is and what they can attain. The producer, after spending time with them, will know what, how much they can attain and how to get the best out of them. And... You, you just go through it. The, the, the Beatles and Duran thing, there, there was really no, no difference. My, my, my time with, with Duran, be it strange, uh, it was exactly the same. It was, we, we all knew what we... Until management and the record company became involved, we all knew what we were heading towards uh, and aiming for. And it was easy. The dis it, no, come on, you can do better than that. Yeah, you're right, it wasn't good enough. And we just, it, we, we got it. It just, you feel it. It's what it's down to. Thank you. Any other questions? Are we there? Hi. Hi. Been a major influence in my career. Um, I'm sorry. Over the years. <laughs> um, I just want to know if um, how different the um, you feel the mixes were uh, after the mastering. Like, did you guys? Because right now, like um, everyone's mastering really loud, and I know for for your time ma mastering. If you went to Bob Ludwig or if you went to George Marino, they actually had a sound because they knew how to, to compress it a certain way so the needle wouldn't jump off the record. You oh, know. Okay, so part of the EMI training, before you could sit behind a, a mixer, behind a console, you had to master because uh, in all their wisdom, 
it's hard, it was harder to get something onto vinyl than it was onto tape. Uh, you had to be careful of phase because it will make the stylus jump. Uh, you had to be careful of too much bass because it will make it jump. And so uh, everyone started off exactly the same way uh, when they started to, to cut at, at Abbey Road. You'd get the first tape in, you'd put it on. This is the first time you're on your own. You put the tape on. You know what? That needs a little bit more top. So you immediately crank up the high end, full bore. Mm, it's better. Now it's lacking a bit of low end. You crank the low end, full bore. Yeah, it's much better. Now it's lacking mids. And you crank the mids, full bore. That lasts for about two days. Next tape, after the two days you put the tape on, oh, that needs a little bit more high end. And one notch at 10, perfect. You learn that very quickly that the artist, the producer and the engineer knew what they were doing in the first place. And what they put onto tape is what they wanted it to sound like. Reggae records, all of the low end that was on them, I, it was intentional. They wanted that. Where uh, They didn't want the mastering engineer to come in and say, oh, so there's way too much low end on that. I'm going to roll it off. A mastering engineer, as far as I'm concerned, as far as my training goes, should take what he's given and do as little as possible because it's the artist, the producer, and the engineer had the concept in the beginning, and that's the way it should be. I understand that these days there are more problems because people are doing things at home and mastering engineers aren't getting as good a recording as they used to get from a, uh, from a top studio. So they might have to do a bit more. But to, it, it's reached the point where mastering engineers are now considered gods. They're, they're more important than the artists. The, and it shouldn't be that way. It, it's they, so many of the mastering engineers today have never got out of the full top, full bass, and full mid concept. Uh, they, they don't. I, the other thing I've seen with mastering engineers is they'll have this on the computer, this thing, oh, we're down in, we're, we're down in like 2.5K, I've got to boost that. They yeah. do it by watching a line as opposed to listening and what, it's, what it sounds like. I, yeah. I, th I, I think it should go back to the way it used to be. And for, maybe for no other reason than to stop a lot of people recording in their bathrooms or their <laughs> bedrooms because uh, if they started to hear what they were really coming out with, Maybe we wouldn't have as many really good studios folding as, as there are. Yes, absolutely. Now, I was, I was wondering if there was a big difference because of um, different pressings from, like, say, Germany or Holland, who are known for good pressings versus, like, some pressings I've heard, it, like, in the U.S., I've compared different pressings. <sighs> Were you, always, were, were you a bit, like, disappointed sometimes when you would hear a certain pressing over... A different pressing, you, or you know, most of the time I I haven't gotten into that too much. Okay. It was yeah. as as far as the the recordings go, which, whichever country I was in, if it was England or or America, I would get the uh, test pressings for that particular country, listen to them, okay them or not okay them, and then go from there. Uh, other countries would get a, a different; t they wouldn't. They'd get copies that they would make, uh, copy tapes that they'd make them from. Right. I have to admit, I, I, I couldn't go through all of them and do it. What, what does fascinate me, y yesterday, uh, the classic album Sundays, the Bowie thing, on, uh, on, of course it had to be on Ziggy. It was a brand new pressing from EMI, and uh, a track and a half through side two started to jump. So I had to go to another pressing, and it was nowhere near as good. It, 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 but uh, and th there are so many different pressings out these days, yeah. and it, 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 I certainly can't keep keep track of them. Most of them I'm not even involved in. Uh, the the latest uh, Ziggy and Aladdin Sane I was involved in because EMI finally came to me and said, "Look, we we want to put it out again. Any thoughts?" And I 
steered them towards uh, a gentleman in England called Ray Staff, who was the original mastering engineer. And he's still going, he's head of Air London mastering these days. And still has the same kind of, he thinks about mastering the same way as I just described. Yeah. Uh, and he and I worked together. He would send me uh, versions that he'd done of, of Ziggy. And I, you know what, the way I used to do it, it was good on track two, just slightly less high end. And we worked together and did it that way. And to me, it's it's the best pressing of, of Ziggy that I've heard in a long, long time. The best pressing I've ever heard was the original pressing of uh, Crime of the Century in England. Because at the time, A&M was distributed by CBS. And we managed to persuade them to put it through the uh, classical department, who had the best vinyl. It was always the way the classical music division of any record company had better vinyl because of the dynamics. They didn't think that you needed good vinyl for pop records. Who yeah. needs... This crap pop music. Who needs good vinyl for that? They they never have dynamics or anything, and so they always kept it for the classical. And we we managed to persuade them, as I say, for crime, and it was astounding. It was so good. If you can get your hands on a copy, yeah, good luck. Try. Well, thank you very much, my Ken pleasure, Scott. my pleasure. <laughs>